Uh, it's certainly been a, an interesting uh, year. Uh, for those that don't know, I've been in the in the fish business since uh, 1984. And before that, uh, I worked for fisheries out of St. Paul for Ray McAwicki, Hugh Norris, uh, from uh, about uh, 82 to 84. But uh, so anyways, I'm really happy. Uh, my, my job is I look after all the fish hatcheries for the province. And so this picture here is the recent fish that was caught on uh, Sunday at uh, a lake up by the hatchery here called Little Bear Lake. And so uh, the guy works for the city of Coal Lake and I grabbed his, uh, his uh, picture. He's about 300 pounds and he was on five inches of ice. Uh, and so <laughs> Stan gave me this photo, a nice, nice rainbow. This is a Campbell Lake strain rainbow from Little Bear Lake. Um, for those I'm sure have seen the, um, the presentation before, I have to sort of say all this. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, stocking really is about creating fisheries in the province, but we're also here to uh, work with the biologists if they want us to try to say work in a river or a lake population of fish to try to maintain it uh, or enhance it. But really our big job uh, in the trout stocking business is creating fishing opportunities throughout the province, as, as most of you guys all know. The, uh, the economic benefit is a new number. Um, this is recent uh, calculations that came out of the federal surveys. And uh, now the, uh, the economic benefit is uh, targeted at $166 million is spent uh, by the anglers in Alberta on stock, stock trout fisheries. So, uh, before our number used to be around that 90 or $100 million number, if you remember, uh, now forecasted up to be 166. And that's because sport fishing in Alberta is like a, a half a, a billion dollar uh, business. Uh, and what we're hearing right now, and I'm sure you guys are, know about it, is uh, about a 30% lift in fishing this, this season because of COVID. So uh, uh, a lot of people are out on the, on the water. So Basically, our purpose is to create fishing opportunities and really spread the fishermen out throughout Alberta. Uh, back in many, many years ago, they were stocking the rivers and creeks with, with, with trout. Uh, but as you know, uh, we rarely ever uh, stock uh, any rivers or creeks uh, now in, in the current uh, system. The only river that we really stock is uh, Medley River up here by Coal Lake. Yeah. So how it works in our business is... Um, the area fisheries biologists they're throughout the province. I'm sure you know many of them. So they decide the different dynamics on, on, a, on a fishery. So they'll, they'll go out and uh, they'll work on the water body, uh, study the oxygen, uh, pH, depth, and uh, understand what kind of uh, predators, if any, uh, what kind of fish are living in these water bodies before they even determine uh, if it's suitable for stocking. A lot of uh, water bodies in Alberta actually uh, come forward by, uh, by the anglers themselves saying, hey, what about checking out this lake over here or the ACA? But, uh, you know, they determine the, the menu as we call it. So they determine, you know, species of fish. Uh, it's going to be when, 3N, the number of fish, uh, the time of the year. So the biologists are getting into that fall stocking, which um, in some cases is sort of supplement uh, what's being taken out on uh, some of these lakes during the summer. And then they decide uh, if how many lakes would be sort of the catch and release, like up in uh, Lower Chain Lake up for the tiger trout on uh, that Marcel's down up there or the size limit, so-called quality fisheries. And then so really uh, our job is to deliver whatever the biologists want. My job is to sort of uh, divide out the, uh, the fish to the various production hatcheries, uh, determine uh, what we can and can't uh, raise for the biologists. And, uh, and go from there. And so really the way it works is the angler, you guys are the client, the client for the biologist and us. And then, you know, their, your, your demands are sort of met by the biologist and then they work with me and the, the facility supervisors on delivering a product. And that's kind of how it somewhat works across Canada. Actually, British Columbia is somewhat a little bit different, but still getting uh, its directions from, from the regional area biologists, but that's pretty much standard across the province, um, the involvement of the biologists and the hatcheries. This is a, a menu pretty much been standard the last couple of years. Our, our, our tiger trout numbers are actually growing, um, anticipating it to be around $50,000, 50,000 50, fish, sorry, for, um, for the uh, next year, 2021. Uh, brown trout been pretty steady, 40, 50 K a year. We mostly grow a really big brown trout. Uh, for those that remember, we used to stock a lot of small brown trout. 
and now we're just strictly stocking the big 19 centimeter uh, brown trout. And, uh, and the brook trout has stayed pretty steady. It's about 75,000 brook trout a year are about 75 grams, 19 centimeters, and the rest would be the 10 gram. Those mostly are the helicopter stockings that we do or the quad stockings like Horseshoe Lake. But uh, we rarely stock a lake that we can get to with a fish truck uh, with a small brookie or a small brown nowadays. It's, uh, it's all usually typically big fish to create that immediate fishery is kind of the, the, way the, <clears throat> the way it's changed since the 1980s. We used to raise a lot of small fish. Now it's to try to put in a 19, 20 centimeter fish right away and uh, create that uh, catchable fish for the, for the fishermen. So roughly about, uh, still about 115,000 kilos of weight that we still stock out. And uh, down below, um, because of COVID, we never went up to Joe Blake this spring to collect uh, cutthroat trout eggs, uh, was canceled. So we didn't stock any of the cutthroat trout egg, uh, lakes this year with uh, any, of the, any of the fish, or, or we don't have any large cutthroats to carry over to the 2021 stocking. And uh, the grailing uh, is delayed at this time. Um, really the big issue for us I was mentioning earlier today is that where is the egg source going to be where where are the biologists can identify where we're going to come in and try to harvest uh, enough adult population um, to to do a spawning and then and then raise them inside the hatch I'll talk a bit more about the grailing program uh, when we talk about the new raven but uh, we did have some lakes down in the uh, Kananaskis country and, and we're really struggling to find any adults now in these ponds down in, in K country. And then the walleye was supposed to be a go uh, in the spring of uh, 2020, but unfortunately uh, with COVID uh, was uh, just deemed from an OHNS standpoint, uh, safety program that uh, was too risky for staff to work side by side, sleeping together uh, in tents or involved, you know, right in trailers. Uh, so they canceled the walleye program uh, and so we'll be, we're ready to go at the fish hatchery. Uh, we've got everything ready at, at the hatchery and for the walleye programs. So the hope is of course in 2021 this spring, we can, we can give it another go and, and look at uh, maybe a couple of different sites to collect the uh, wall eggs. And I'll come back and I'll show you some work that we did on, on the, uh, on the walleye program this summer. Um, the, uh, uh, fish hatcheries, we got four fish hatcheries. We call it the brood stations is where the adult uh, brood fish are, are kept. The Allison Creek down in Crossing Pass. They have two rainbow trout strains. And then we've got the brown trout there, the brook trout there, and, and also a cutthroat trout uh, strain from Joe Blake. And so they have our own brood fish and they'll be producing eggs uh, this spring. Uh, so it will be pretty exciting. We've never done that before. And so we're really looking forward to it. And we'll, we'll probably be spawning those fish around May or June. And we'll have our own in-house uh, uh, recreational uh, stock fishery uh, for cutthroat trout. I don't anticipate the biologists asking us to use any of those cutthroat trout into any of the creeks that they're trying to uh, bring back a population or introduce a new population. This is, these fish, I'm pretty confident, will just be for recreational fisheries, uh, but uh, that'll be great. And this way we'll be able to produce cutthroat trout every year. And so instead of uh, every second year, so it's uh, and and not have to go to Joe Blake anymore. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Joe Blake uh, in 2021 for the last uh, camp, uh, beautiful location, uh, and, and Lane that runs the uh, Alice Creek Hatchery. He, what he wants to do is just wants to go in there and, and do more one-on-one -on -one spawnings, so that his uh, genetics of his uh, existing uh, cutthroat trout uh, fish um, are much more solid. So. We will go back in, uh, usually that camps around May long weekend, and we'll be back in there this spring. Uh, the Raven, of course, uh, really exciting uh, right now for the Raven, it's down in Carolina, and uh, we've got two rainbow trout strains in there. And we also purchase uh, 900,000 trout lodge uh, eggs. So, and they, we buy off of trout lodge, it's the world's largest supplier of rainbow trout eggs, and they'll deliver an egg any time of the year, which is really unique. And the, the cost of these eggs is really uh, inexpensive. It's about six cents Canadian and at really good value. Typically what we do is we stock these fish in lakes that more or less don't uh, necessarily carry over for the following year. Um, but the biologists uh, do like stocking the all females 
uh, three end fish into lakes like say Mirror Lake and that. Uh, and we have stocked the all female two ends in some of the lakes around the Edmonton area. And, and I'll sort of show that later on. Two strains of Trout Lodge fish that we buy, the Trout Lodge jumpers, the TLTLJs or the, or the Ks, the, and the K means Kamloop. So it's a strain that uh, Trout Lodge got from uh, Southern BC many, many, many years ago. Uh, they're very, uh, the jumpers is like their domesticated strain, um, pretty hardy fish and grows very fast if the, if the food is, is there. And we have the two big production hatcheries, Sam Livingston in Calgary, and then uh, the Cold Lake Fish Hatchery. So most of you know, uh, the Alberta government, even uh, with the NDP and, and now with the UCP, major uh, capital investment in the fish hatchery. And so uh, pretty exciting times for us. And uh, so we've had individual uh, construction contracts for each of the four hatcheries now. And so the Ellison Creek hatchery is just about finished now. And uh, it was a hatchery built in, uh, it started up in the early 80s. And so you can imagine what we're basically doing is replacing uh, the, 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 the hot water tank and the furnace. And, and, and so we're going in there replacing all of the water reuse system uh, in the fish hatchery and putting in, installing today's uh, technology inside the, the building. And at the same time, the hatchery is still operating, which it, it's pretty uh, tricky. And, uh, and it's been challenging for, for Lane and his staff down there, but it's gonna be a brand new water reuse system. And uh, at, at the Allison Creek, they have uh, quite a few concrete raceways and we're gonna get out of as much concrete raceways as we can. Today's technology, um, Everybody's moving to uh, circular rearing tanks. And so it's much more easier to clean. The fish are always swimming, in a, you know, and so better performance. And so the hatchery won't be able to raise any more fish, but the water quality is gonna be improved vastly, we hope. And so we're, we're turning on that system uh, uh, in the beginning of December, and then uh, and away we go and tie it in and, and turn it on and, and hope everything is uh, functioning. The Sam Livingston has been a, a challenging uh, replacement of the water reuse system facility. It was offline for a year and a half. And the Calgary Hatchies was, is amazing where you've got uh, over a million liters of water on one level and then underneath you is uh, the, the old reuse facility. And they use gravel bed filtration method to uh, take out the, the poop and the pee and the water, et cetera. And, uh, and now we're going to be, our footprint down there is about a fifth of the original design down there with the, the new technology. And uh, so it's a maze of pipes if you've ever been down there. And now you had to uh, work with uh, the new system and installing it and try to build it around the maze of pipes down in that basement. So it has been a challenged uh, construction project. It, uh, to be honest with you, it, it has been a tough one uh, to work with, and uh, but the staff have been uh, it's up in, been up and running, and uh, and we'll have uh, you know we'll be we're raising fish there right now, and they're just the staff are just working out some of the bugs on the new equipment, and uh, we'll be we'll be good to go. Uh, we'll do some we'll we'll do some small tweaks to fix it up uh, the way we want it, but basically that hatchery's back up and running, and. Uh, and, and, and thank God, because the staff, uh, you know, were offline for a year and a half. And so I was moving them around uh, to the other facilities and they were doing other stuff for me, but uh, we're pretty happy to be back in that business. Is uh, everybody okay? We're, we're doing okay? <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Okay, the hatcheries were built uh, in the, uh, in the, oh, sorry, sorry. This is um, the Allison Creek hatchery. And uh, for those that have never been here, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but the, uh, the front of this, this hatchery right here is where we're gonna be building, where, where the new reuse and all that is in here. So when you come in the Allison Creek, right where this tree is, we'll all be taking, it's all new now. And back here is where the water reuse uh, facility is and all that's gutted out. And, uh, and uh, this new, new building will be here in the Allison Creek uh, hatchery. Beautiful location. Um, and uh, we have three staff that work there full time. The, uh, the, the, the big pro uh, projects now going forward are, are these two here, Coal Lake and Raven. And so there'll be a three-year project. Um, the Coal Lake one 
it, it just got awarded to Stantec. And uh, Stantec is going to be doing three different uh, systems for us. The big one, of course, is that uh, the Coal Lake Hatchery brings in 300 liters per second of water from Coal Lake, heated up. You know, it ozonates the water, so it kills the virus in the lake, which is IPN, infectious pancreatic necrosis, and, um, and then heats, heats it up and uh, goes through the fish and then goes back to the lake. And what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to be installing reuse technology and, uh, and, and, and bring back the water uh, to the fish and, and clean it up and bring it back. And so we'll be reducing our water intake demand hugely from the lake and reducing our natural gas bill uh, substantially by, by not having to heat that water. We'll be capturing our heat, bringing it back, clean the water up, and uh, put it back to the fish. So pretty exciting uh, times. Uh, you know, the hatchery in Coal Lake was built in 86. So uh, this will be a big change for the staff at the hatchery now to have to deal with uh, worth reuse, which does come with uh, some challenges. Uh, you have to really watch what you're, what you're doing there, but uh, <clears throat> it'll gonna be better for the fish. And I'll show you a picture in final ring how to improve the fish, uh, um, uh, you know, their, their life in the raceways. We're also got a leak in our head box. And so we've had a leak in our head box for many years. And we're, so we're gonna actually do a shutdown and, uh, and put in like a, a liner type of thing, whether it's gonna be a spray on my line or not, but we're gonna fix this uh, major leak that we got uh, over, uh, in the head box. And then all the electrical main system is gonna be replaced with, uh, with the new, uh, new system. So we're actually gonna shut down the hatchery uh, in the summer of 2022 and not have any fish in the building for probably about 60 days and then allow for the tie-in and also allow them an opportunity to do the electrical and uh, deal with the head box repair. So I'm, I'm hoping, uh, you know, um, when we go to tender, which will probably be for construction, probably about uh, early summer, I imagine Stantec would be ready to design and put it out for, for bid um, that the, the company that wins it uh, will be ready the following summer uh, to do some of the big the big jobs here, and then the hope is is that we can turn the system on uh, by early 2023, and away we go. Uh, the beauty of the Coal Lake one is that it's just going to be tied into the existing water system, so it should be pretty painless to uh, uh, to, to to tie it in, and not like um, some of the other projects we've done. So that's exciting for Coal Lake, and then the Raven is the big one where um, for the first time in in a lot of our career, uh, we're gonna build a, a new facility. And it's uh, gonna be right at the existing location. Uh, for those that have been at Raven, there's like an, an old cook shack there before you get to the houses. It's gonna be right in that open clearing right there uh, as of now. And so uh, HDR is a big company. Um, we've got aquaculture specialists from the United States and so does Stantec, by the way, um, that are involved in the project. So both both Coal Lake and Raven have uh, U.S. aquaculture specialists that have done some major hatcheries, uh, Alaska hatchery, um, I think it's called like Fernandez or Hernandez hatchery. Um, so they've got some big hatchery background, both companies. And uh, so we're in the design stage right now. Uh, HDR is actually on site at Raven uh, today and we have a big design meeting tomorrow um, on Zoom. and. Uh, and so we hope to go for construction tender uh, late spring of 2021, put it out, uh, see how the bid comes in. And uh, during construction, the, the old Raven will still operate until the new one is, is uh, functional. So the beauty of that is, is that uh, the new Raven, um, you're gonna be able to build it. And then with the reuse, you're able to exceed the, uh, the filters and get all the bacteria going in the, uh, and, uh, and then we'll slowly introduce the fish and we'll just bring, bring the brood fish over from uh, the old raven over to the new one and, and take our time. So it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a good transition. I can see the, uh, the, the 2023 as the year of us uh, transitioning from the old into the new and uh, let the system um, you know, go, uh, come along really slowly instead of just pounding it right away like we did at the Calgary Hatchery here just recently. Um, some highlights of the raven. He is, uh, it'll be of course the first new provincial hatchery since uh, 86. So it's been a long time. Um, it's gonna really allow us to increase uh, trout stocking. So we really haven't been able to go out and, uh, 
and look at expanding our ability. If you go back to that, uh, the, the weight that I told you that we could raise, I think it was like 115,000 kilos or something like that. This is going to allow us now to add another 10 to 13,000 kilos of fish uh, weight. And so that's about another 10% increase. And so to put that in kind of a fish world, um, if Peter was able to put 100,000 20 centimeter um, rainbows into Muir Lake, uh, he's probably cringing right now, but you know that'd be about 8,600 kilos of, uh, of weight. So uh, we'll be able to raise some significant uh, poundage. Uh, my thoughts right now is that uh, the Raven will stock the west side of Highway 2 from, um, from uh, Cochrane all the way up to uh, Edson area, and then maybe touch into uh, some of the Grand Prairie area uh, some small ponds up there so that take pressure off of Harvey at a Coal Lake. Uh, Harvey's uh, staff at Coal Lake got to do a lot of small pond stocking everywhere. And you can actually get up to that Grand Prairie area faster from Caroline than you can from Coal Lake. So we're going to diversify the Raven uh, lakes that they're going to stock uh, once we're up and running. So it'd be pretty exciting for them. We, that new hatch is going to have a brand new tandem axle fish truck and tanks. And so, you know, they're, they're going to be up and, and running and it's going to be a quite a pretty little building when it's done. The, uh, the big thing for the hatchery is we're going to be able to increase our existing uh, brood fish that we have uh, on site right now, expand the amount of adults that we're carrying. And the beauty of that will be is as you're, um, we'll be able to stock out more real big brood fish uh, and, and the two-year-old recruits, which have been really popular in some of the lakes that we've been uh, we've been putting them. We tried to put some in the Edmonton area. I think we put some in Star Lake here this, this year. And so uh, we'll have, be able to raise more in-house eyed eggs on those two strains. And then, uh, so they'll each have their own building. So that the, the new Raven will have a dedicated room for each um, of the, the rainbow trout lines. So they have a dedicated room of the, uh, the Campbell Lake by Campbell Lake strain. And so what I mean by a dedicated room is um, you'll, you'll um, you'll have a, a small troughs that you'll incubate the fish, uh, the, the future recruits, and uh, you'll have uh, circulars for the fish as they're growing from, from say five centimeters to 15 centimeters. And then eventually they'll be in big, huge uh, circulars. And eventually at, at three years old, you'll spawn them, you'll put them in these uh, concrete raceways and uh, spawn them either as a three-year-old or four-year-old. And so in a, in a brood line, you always have either a, a, a small fry, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, or you might have a, um, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. And so you always have a two-year gap in these, uh, these dedicated lines. And so um, and that's why you'll see us sometimes we stock out a three-year-old adult fish, or sometimes we stock out a four-year-old uh, adult fish after we, we've uh, taken the eggs from them. We rarely, in the rainbow trout business, keep them around for a three and a four year olds or a five year old spawning. They always want to have, a, we've gone to a smaller adult fish because of, uh, if you remember, I've told you guys about uh, the injury to our, uh, our wrists and our shoulders with our staff. And so we try to go with a smaller brood fish than those five and six year old um, adult fish like we used to have in the, in the old days. Um, the, the third room, as we're calling it, is going to be split in half. And uh, what it's going to be is, uh, again, depending on the biologist, we're going to uh, have half of that third room dedicated either to another cutthroat trout strain or a bull trout uh, strain. And so we're just waiting a direction from uh, the biologist. And, uh, and so we'll see, but it'll be designed so that if they want to get into the bull trout, and this is the idea here is to create an adult brood program that you can recruit fish uh, eggs from and grow them for production. And so we're gonna have space dedicated for that. And, uh, and then the other half of the room is gonna be dedicated for grailing. And so the grailing program uh, will be, it, it'll house the adult fish and you might not need a lot of adult fish to get the amount of fry and fingerlings that the biologists want us for stocking in, in the lakes in Alberta. So this is again, this will be a really big new program uh, that uh, we're gonna design it for. And in the end, if, if it doesn't, uh, if, if the, the biologists don't ask us, we can always adapt and uh, put in uh, another trope program. And so the way these fish hatcheries are built, 
it's a plug and play. And so we can quickly modify uh, hatcheries um, in this third room, depending on where, where the direction is. I mean, who knows where the direction will be in 20, 30 years from now, but the way we'll design hatcheries is, is the ability to uh, change them out, right? I think there's a question there. Yeah, so you, you, you mentioned bull trout. I mean, I know that grayling have been stocked in lakes. Yeah. Um, but is, is this bull trout you're talking about also uh, aimed at stocking in lakes? It would be uh, a good question. It would be whatever the biologists want us to do. So maybe they would go back and stock uh, uh, rivers or creeks that uh, the bull trout population isn't really threatened, right? Um, but right now, there's, not, there's no way... Um, the, the biologists don't have a, the ability to house bull trout and, and for us to, to raise uh, bull trout fingerlings to backstock, backstock uh, any, any water bodies, whether it's a creek, river, whatever. So we're giving them the ability to uh, look at that. Eh? And so uh, we're just waiting. We're the Maytag repairmen. So if they want to go in in certain bull trout areas, um, it'll be their call. Um, where they this half this room if they want to go cuts or if they want to go bull trout now they may okay, um, so in, they may be for recreational fishing right you never know um they if it's for recreational fishing i wouldn't be surprised that, i mean i'm only guessing here but i wouldn't be surprised that they would want the bull trout to be triploid which is no problem guys like lane and brian that runs a raven uh, they can figure out how to triploid a, a bull trout no problem okay so the I guess you're 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 assuming that the intent wouldn't be to, to let's say tr try to take uh, bull trout from us from a certain watershed and basically enhance the population with similar genetic material. This would be uh, just basically no, you sterile could. fish for for no, you, for you could no, you could do exactly like you said. Um, is you could go into that water body, take uh, the eggs from them. And then uh, raise them, raise them in the facility here uh, as a brood fish, and then take you know eventually say three four years later, they're producing offspring, and go back to that lake and stock it with two in fish. Yeah, you could do exactly like you said. It, it all depends on which direction the biologists want us to do. Yeah, you know all that stuff has to be sort of figured out uh, before you uh, take the eggs before you fertilize them. We just need to know if we're going to pressure or shock, uh, pressure, put the eggs under pressure to change them to a triplet. But, uh, you know, this is all kind of uh, right now, um, you know, visioning out, right? So, so we're, we're waiting for the direction from the biologist on where, where they want to go. And um, so we're going to build it to, because it doesn't matter if it's bull trout or cuts, they're going to utilize the same equipment in this half of this room. The grayling is a bit different because you're going to feed them a bit different than you would the, uh, the trout streams, strains. We're good? Okay, thank you. Um, the big one there is that raven, uh, surprising enough, a lot of people uh, go through the ravens, a beautiful site uh, for those that have gone there. So the hatchery is going to be built uh, so that it allows for a self-guided public tour. And so they're probably in the initial design right now, I'm pretty excited that the people will be able to walk and sort of be above uh, the facility and look down. So it uh, could be pretty exciting uh, if that's the way it goes in the end. Um, and then the, uh, the vision from the minister, uh, Nixon, is to, uh, you know, we've got a beautiful location there. And, and, and can we utilize that site and, and for what purpose the old facility site? And uh, you know, do we make a huge, large pond in the, on that site for fishing and utilize the spring water? So uh, we hope to uh, to work on that kind of thing uh, after the hatchery is built, uh, and we'll see where we're at. So it'll be uh, it'll be a really exciting uh, exciting time. I mean, a lot of the the momentum in uh, in uh, in um, the fish hatchery business has been Minister Nixon has done a great job on on really promoting uh, the, the, you know, the fish hatcheries and we're, we're really, really happy with that. It's uh, been a long time since we've seen so much investment. It's well over $40 million invested uh, in the facilities here the last couple of years. Um, I just wanted to show you uh, this picture. This is final ring at, at Coal Lake. And uh, 
So all of this water in a reuse is going to be recaptured. So if you look on the bottom left, uh, well, 1.3 million liters of water is what you're looking at. And so if you look at the sort of the bottom right, you'll see the water coming into the raceway. And uh, that's about 20,000 fish or you know, about 18,000 fish sitting in that raceway, all that whole darkness there. And uh, so the problem right now with Coal Lake is that exchange is less than one an hour. So the incoming water flow at the hatchery just isn't that great. Luckily, the water is so super rich of oxygen because of the ozone treatment. It's super rich with oxygen. Yeah, we, we get away with uh, a lot of forgiveness there. And so with the new reuse, we're going to capture that water, clean it up, and bring it back. And we're actually going to be able to increase the, the flow coming into final ring by two and a half to three times. So it's going to be really exciting so that the fish won't know what hit them because there's going to be a better flow and uh, we should have a better quality fish. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to raise more fish, uh, but the water will be warmer. Uh, that water in the winter time is about three degrees Celsius. And so with the reuse, we'll probably be able to raise these fish at six to eight degrees in final rain um, for at least three quarters of the raceway. So I'm expecting that we'll have a shorter period of time in raising the fish at Coal Lake, which again will lower our cost and uh, allow us maybe a little bit more on the management size to move fish around a bit better. But it's a big building and it can raise a lot of fish. There's 56 raceways here in this building. And then in early rearing, there's 85 troughs. So we'll design early rearing so that it has the ability to, to, to use reuse water or fresh water. Uh, so it, it's gonna be pretty exciting times at, at the hatchery. For those that don't know, when this hatchery was built in the early 80s, uh, all these walls were mesh. <laughs> and so um, this was the first uh, project that we did in the hatchery in 1987 as we uh, enclosed the building. But it was, uh, it was quite a, an experience working there in 19, the winter of 1986. Um, so that's kind of the um, sort of the gist of the, <clears throat> what the hatcheries here in the last couple of years and in, in investment by the province, some pretty exciting times for us. Um, it's kind of, it's going to need to uh, be designing a hatchery from scratch with the with the uh, professionals. So um, it'll be a good, good way to for some of us to end our career. The um, some exciting stuff that we uh, we did uh, this year. Uh, we uh, we and I'll sort of explain some of them as as we go in the in the next slides. And uh, so these are just some of the work that uh, our crew did this year. We've worked with Parks Canada and incubated uh, some cutthroat trout. Uh, we did some intensive netting of Prussian carp at Blood Indian, and uh, we we started really kicking the tires in a big way on uh, some of our stock fisheries. We probably went to about nine or ten lakes this year, and uh, tried to evaluate not only uh, survival uh, but also uh, growth rate. And uh, we did a big walleye live netting program at Lexanam, and then. Uh, and then a winter creel at, uh, at uh, we're getting ready to do a winter creel at Hassey Lake. These are <clears throat> some of the stuff that um, um, uh, my staff have been working on. Um, I know a lot of you guys have seen this picture before, but uh, this is a, a, a trailer that we converted into a quarantine facility uh, dedicated for West Lobe Cuts. This unit that you see there, the heat stacks, the trays are at the very top of that picture. And uh, you can put your eggs inside there as green eggs, fertilized green eggs, and uh, <clears throat> they'll stay there right till they hatch out if you so desire. And at the bottom, that's a continuous loop system that uh, <clears throat> reuses the water 99%. Uh, then you're just adding a small amount of water uh, in, in, the, in, the, in that system. And uh, we have that park right beside the Allison Creek Hatchery, but it's all dedicated uh, different equipment, the staff come in there, disinfect and come in there and work. And so these are for the wild eggs. Um, and so it's, it's geared for the cuts right now, but to be honest with you, it could pretty much be wired up to do any kind of a species of fish. Uh, um, it's a pretty cool system. And we probably did this whole unit here. Um, that in, <clears throat> that, that uh, reuse system there, that's about $50,000. Uh, so about for $100,000, um, you're good to go. And so with Parks Canada, uh, they approached us 
and uh, there was a window for them to uh, um, come in in, in, in uh, June there. And so they went and collected some cutthroat trout uh, with our staff and um, they worked at this outlet creek and I, and I had Coral Creek and I got corrected today that uh, it was not Coral Creek, but it was a creek, uh, another creek just west of Lake Louise. And um, the Parts Canada crew are out of the Lake Louise area. And uh, we, our guys came in and, and spawned the fish in the field once they had caught enough. And then they, we brought the uh, fertilized eggs to the hatchery. And then we, we uh, incubated them in those uh, trays that I showed you in that picture. And then until they're eyed up. And then the eyed eggs were brought back to the creek that they came from and incubated in an RSI. I think you guys have seen the pictures of those until they swim up. And so uh, we, we had two successful um, operations there from two different sites. And uh, Parks Canada was really great to work with them. And uh, so pretty, pretty exciting uh, times with them. And they're looking at um, getting the funds to actually build their own system and uh, utilize it uh, out at uh, Lake Louise. Did you have a question? Anybody have a question? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, these are presumably tributaries to the bow, right? Um, well, these, these, these are in theory uh, pretty isolated creeks. Uh, oh, I don't, okay. Yeah, they're, they're in, yeah. <clears throat> the idea is that these populations in theory are, are pure cuts. And so, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, some That's of them are uh, as wide as your desk. Um, it, it was neat actually going down there uh, down a couple of years ago and looking at some of the sites that they want to, to take fish from. You're just like, wow. So, so creeks as wide as my desk can be uh, pretty good fishing, you know. Yeah. So yeah that's... <laughs> but you can see in the picture, uh, that's Ryan that works for us. And so um, you can see how big that cut was. And uh, they're getting, fish, yeah. you know, just a small amount of eggs from them. And so they, they bring us in and, and we're doing what, what's in that picture there. It's called a dry spawning. And uh, you don't want to have the ovarian fluid that comes up with the eggs uh, when you transport them. And so it's, the eggs are kept dry. And um, and then they uh, they'll take from the males, they'll spawn them, the the males into a small dish, and then use syringe needles to suck up the uh, milt, and maybe do the spawning right there, or bring the eggs back to the uh, quarantine building and finish off the fertilization. Okay, yeah. I, I had a, a the, my, my real question is, okay. is is actually different. This is just a, a preliminary one. Um, okay. The now that we have. Um, significant uh, watersheds impacted by, by whirling disease in Alberta. Um, how, I mean, is, is there a, a concern at all mm -hmm. for you in terms of, you know, uh, getting, getting eggs from wild fish and, and how do you, I mean, how, how does that impact you? How do you deal with it? Well, most of these, uh, great question. Uh, so a lot of the creeks and, and, and rivers in that section of Alberta and into BC have all been tested for whirling disease. Um, so the, the staff have done a really good job down there of, of identifying where, where it is and where it isn't. Uh, we wouldn't, um, that's the beauty of the quarantine facility is that uh, if they're, say, the, say the, uh, the, the fish had whirling disease, um, we're just working in the quarantine facility. So that whirling disease wouldn't come in to our, our, our main building. All the equipment that you see Ryan wearing can only be dedicated to the field. And what's not being shown in this picture is all of the equipment gets disinfected with, uh, with, a, with a product called Quad Plus. So it's um, with whirling disease, everything's disinfected. It's pretty, it's pretty rigorous now to go out into the field now for everybody. Uh, they have to follow some pretty strict uh, procedures. But uh, these fish, um, if we were to bring them inside the main hatchery, so uh, these fish, of course, are going to go back into these RSIs, which will be the next slide here. Um, if we were to bring these fish inside uh, and create a, our own brood program, we would test the fish at these locations for whirling disease and any other viruses before we would even try to do a collection. And so in these wild egg takes, we are, that's why we're calling the, the trailer a quarantine trailer because it's under quarantine. You can't, you have to basically, you know, almost strip down 
and get in there. So what we typically do is uh, always have one person only, most cases working dedicated to the trailer. And they'll either start their shift that day in that trailer and then exit and just let the, you know, the eggs sit for the, the day. You know, we're not talking a lot of eggs. So the, the manpower involved is pretty limited. When the, when the, the eggs eye up, we're going to bring them back into these RSIs. And, and these are these neat RSIs. I think some of these we're trying to build and uh, very simple. We saw this in Montana when we went down there a couple of years ago. And that pipe is just, the, the, you can see the person's got a dam up there with the top of the pitcher. And then, and then the pipe is just running along the bottom of the creek and then coming up into these uh, really expensive uh, uh, pails here. And then uh, we fill the pails with packing material and you can see the staff are, are now returning the eyed eggs into the, uh, the polycones and the eggs will sort of fall in, into the polycones and uh, so you can see the water coming in at the bottom and it sort of upwells through the polycones and then out. You can see in the, in the top uh, left of the bucket, you can see the exit hole for the uh, water. And uh, so once the, 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 the fish hatches out of the eggshell, it sort of sits in these polycones with its sac fry, uh, yolk sac for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then of course buttons up and then comes to the surface uh, and, and out, out it goes. And, and so the staff are always coming back and checking it. They, they make these things bear proof or try to as best they can. And so they always come back and check uh, these things uh, each day. And uh, what they do is once they start seeing some of the surface, what they'll do then is take out all of the polycones because sometimes there is fish at the very bottom and then they'll just pour them into the, into the creek. The idea is that the, uh, the fish is now in, gonna imprint on the creek um, and so it's a, it's a really becoming a popular, popular way of, uh, of uh, returning fish to the creek that you're taking the adults from. Hopefully I got most of your answers there. Okay, great. Always like, it. Is, is there anybody else want a question or we're all good? Okay, um, so here's a, pretty cool project that uh, we worked on in the heat of uh, July and, and saw some pretty cool weather <laughs> disturbances come through us when we're camping. But uh, Blood Indian is, is a big fishery uh, for the hatchery. Um, you can see the numbers at the top of the year, uh, top of the page. You know, if, if you think about uh, we're raising, let's just say two million fish a year, you can see some of the numbers uh, of fish that we're putting in this water body. And so fish hatcheries have a pretty vested interest in, uh, in making sure this fishery is, uh, is, is going to turn into a winner. And so it, it's always been stocked with small fish. So we're, we're putting about 110,000 uh, 5 to 10 rainbows in there in the spring and 7,500 browns, uh, the 19 centimeter browns. And, and uh, Jason uh, Cooper at a Red Deer has been uh, you know, asking to get brown stocked in, in uh, blood in for a few years now. And, and you'll see in the data, it's turned out to be a pretty successful move. And um, in the fall, we've turned around and we try to put a bigger fish in for the winter fishery. And we also put in the tigers, 7,500 tigers. And uh, in 2019, we also stocked, and again, this year, uh, we stocked uh, sort of leftover tiger trout. And any, in some years, it can be 20 to, to 40,000 or so or more tiger trout and you're saying well why leftovers uh, what it is is that uh, we'll get into the slides later on is is sometimes you, you get better survival on the tigers and we only want to carry over through the winter at Coal Lake Hatchery uh, the amount that the biologists want us to stock the following year so it spaces every single rearing trough and, and tank and raceway at the Coal Lake Hatchery is full of fish so we, we uh, stocked them into um, into blood Indian the surplus yeah go ahead Dan did you have a question We're good. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the, the stockings of uh, the brook trout uh, previous years haven't been showing up in the, in the creole, which is, which is interesting. Uh, so we've stopped stocking uh, brook trout in, in this lake. And, uh, and so we were approached by special areas because uh, the fishery is declining for the rainbow trout fishery. And um, there's been, of course, a large increase in Prussian carp population in Sicily. So we, we decided to, uh, to uh, take on uh, 
uh, the request from special areas and we committed a, a lot of staff uh, even this old guy was out there and um, so we worked for 18 days on the reservoir we did uh, two crews of uh, nine days on the water each and uh, an objective really to be honest with you guys was to was to remove as much Prussian carp as we could uh, not knowing really how how many carp were in there were there to remove we also uh, put in uh, 12 uh, uh, this North American standard index net um, in, in certain locations in their reservoir uh, to collect the data on what we caught. These are overnight to 24 hour sets or 18 to 24 hour sets. Uh, and, and, and we're doing that for Jason to give him the data on, uh, on, on what we caught so that he can compare um, the catch uh, versus the previous years that they've done these types of netting on, on Blood Indian. And so some of the work that we did, we did uh, 335 uh, shoreline seines, and uh, we did 181 fike net sets. So these are overnight uh, sets of this, this type of net that we do that does not kill the fish. And 133 uh, short set gill nets that would only run for 30 minutes. And the reason why that is, is that we're just, if we caught any trout, we want to release them fast and so that they can survive. And, and I, I think, you know, when doing these short set gill nets, uh, all 133, I think we only killed it, two trout the whole time uh, on running those um, short set gill nets. It's something that, uh, that I used to do way back in the early eighties. And uh, I really, I like their effective, you can really go and find the fish, uh, the carp. This is really what the main focus was with these short sets was to go after the carp, find where they are, then come in with the fight nets and let them fish um, continuously in these, uh, in these real key spots, because when you were on Blood Indian, it was surprising where you actually found the uh, the carp. Um, so it, it was kind of neat. It was a lot of fun in the beginning. Uh, you can see by some of the stats uh, that the, the seining, mostly the seining, caught 345,000 young of the year year carp, and we caught almost 5,500 one year old carp plus plus one year old carp. We caught 372 brown trout. Uh, the average size being 32 centimeters. And this is through using all of the different types of uh, nets that I'm talking about. Uh, you wouldn't catch a brown trout uh, with, uh, with shoreline seines, but the fikes and the short set gill nets and the nason nets, uh, those are the kind of numbers that we caught. 372 brownies, uh, 767 rainbow trout, uh, smaller average size, and I'll sort of explain that later. And then uh, uh, 77 tigers we we're a little bit disappointed actually to be honest with you on uh on the low level of tigers that we caught um this is a picture of uh, a nascent net in action so the staff are uh, bringing in the fish um, they're all going to be uh, pretty much dead um and so unfortunately the carp were just nasty to uh pick through in the netting and then you need a recorder because they're going to measure the fish and uh so it, it all needs to be recorded uh, uh, pretty pretty detailed uh, work. And then um, this is me actually on the, on the, on the left there, uh, seining uh, the, the fish along the banks. And uh, you would pull this seine and all the, the carp would kind of go to that box in the middle. And, um, and you're just working the shoreline and uh, you'll collect, uh, you know, some seines we pulled out 5,000, a carp in, in walking maybe 50 feet and just doing a button hook and then coming up on the shoreline and then pulling up the, uh, the seine. Um, in that far corner there, that picture is like a, a little uh, ravine that the, the water in the springtime, all of the cow manures coming in there, but uh, the uh, pelicans were in those, into those little fingers there of that top left like something crazy. Uh, they did it like, if anybody's seen killer whales, uh, when they, they force the salmon up against the, the end, uh, they just take turns. And this is what the pelicans do at Blood Indian. They swarm the, the carp, they get them to the very end. And it's just a feeding frenzy of, uh, you know, 50 or so pelicans just feeding uh, like crazy on all the carp. This is the uh, picture of um, the different sizes of carp in, uh, in the lake. And uh, so some really big monster ones. And then these small little ones at the top of the big guy, that's what we're catching in the seine. We also caught the uh, smaller size, uh, uh, you know, carp there above the big one. We would catch those fish in the, uh, in the seine. But they, these things move really fast uh, when they're in the water and you're seining. You sort of have to pay attention. 
And you saw, look at the water quality. This is what it, it is throughout the lake. Uh, really murky uh, water, visibility is really poor. Uh, so when, when you're uh, seining, you're, you're, you, you, uh, you can see the little guys uh, at the top of the water column, but you have no idea what's going down uh, where you're walking uh, in the feet. Like there's these big boulders. And it's really weird uh, place there because you would be seining and all of a sudden you're coming across massive boulders that back in the day, somebody had a fence line made out of boulders. And so um, <laughs> we, we, we had to sew up a lot of seines when we were working there. Um, this is sort of a summary of the, of the, the data. Uh, we caught many brown trout uh, that were 40 centimeters or bigger. And yet there's fishermen fishing all over the reservoir and uh, hardly anybody is catching any fish. And I, and I got a feeling that the visibility is so bad because um, down, down the bottom, you can see them on the fish finder, all of the big trout uh, in, the, in the deeper water at Blood Indian, but uh, they're just not biting anybody hooks. Uh, lots of fathead minnows in this reservoir. And of course the carp for these brown trout to feed on. I, I don't think there's a shortage of food for the brownies. Um, the tiger trout we're expecting, we're hoping um, that there should be a big pulse coming through from the 2019 small tigers we stocked. We picked a lot of tigers up in our, our seining that uh, we're starting to get around 15, 18 centimeters. So we're hoping that they're, they're eventually this lake will start to produce some, some tigers for them. And um, the rainbow trout that we stocked uh, at the small size seemed to really pick off those tiny carp that I showed you in the picture. And they're feeding quite well. They're growing two centimeters a month, uh, which is pretty good. And that's the Campbell Lake strain. We've always felt that the Campbell Lake strain like eating minnows. And so we, we've kind of tried to revert uh, uh, the Campbell Lake strain into blood Indian if we can do it uh, rather than the trout lodge fish. And so we're going to really try to uh, focus on putting more Campbell Lake strain rainbows in that reservoir to, to maybe pick off these uh, carp that are everywhere. Um, sort of the summary of the, of the lake, um, we have a big concern about the water quality. Uh, it's really poor clarity. Uh, the water is just churned up by these carp. Uh, and uh, you know what the big shock was, uh, being a walleye guy, uh, there was hardly any invertebrates in the water column and no shrimp to be found. And uh, so really concerning about where, what kind of good food there is for the, the trout in there. Um, and it looks like these uh, carp have really done a number on that reservoir. Here's the size of uh, one of the brownies that we caught. Mm -hmm. And so the fisher, you can sort of see at the bottom of the bucket. So what they're doing is uh, behind that worker is the fike nets that we use. Uh, they're great for, uh, for catching baby walleye. So we brought them to the reservoir and they did really outstanding. And they'll, they'll be measuring those fish down at the bottom in that bucket and uh, they'll just release these fish. Uh, these are just some of the, the, the uh, growth rates at, uh, at Blood Indian. And so um, the top of the, the line going up and down sort of gives you the, the, from the lowest to the biggest uh, brown trout in blue, rainbow trout in orange, and then the tigers in grays, the minimum and maximum size, and then sort of you know, the X is basically representing sort of the, the mean average. So, um, you know, big, big size difference and some big brownies, almost 60 centimeters in, the, in that reservoir. So pretty, pretty good uh, indication. The, 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 uh, the rainbow trout were, are small, as you can see by the data. And uh, the tiger trout we have down at the bottom, um, you can see that there's a lot of dots down at the bottom, starting to pick up a lot of small tigers with the same and uh, which is encouraging. So we're hoping. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. ahead. Yep. Yes, uh, when you were doing the netting on Blood Reservoir and with the carp, did you guys, like after you brought them in, did you guys uh, dispose of them or introduce them back in? Or I could have showed you these some really nice pictures of uh, dead carp. I didn't think that would go over very well. But uh, um, so the, the 350,000 small ones, um, basically uh, we just let them dry on shore. Uh, and uh, we were very popular with some of the little shorebirds that would follow us uh, as we sang. It was hilarious. But uh, no, the, any trout, I mean, sorry, any carp that we, um, that we knew that the fishermen on shore uh, would take from us, uh, then we, we gave them out. Yeah, we were a big hit. Um, our only concern was is uh, some of the fishermen wanted the carp to be alive. And uh, oh, wow. they, 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 they don't want us to kill the carp. They, they want to bring it back 
uh, to their their house uh, semi alive. Um, but uh, so we would kill them and uh, and give them to them. Yeah, either that or they didn't get them. But uh, we tried to give all of the carp to the fishermen. And they, you, if you've never been there, the uh, the change in the uh, fishermen from trout now to Prussian carp. There's all these guys fishing with the long poles uh, throughout the throughout the reservoir and a uh, pretty dedicated lot and uh, so what we did was uh, we were killing lots of fish right and uh, almost all of those i think it was five thousand big carp that we caught we, we tried to give every single carp away that we could yeah because what you were saying with the uh with the disappearance of the invertebrates surely the carps because they're kind of a bottom feeder aren't they yeah yeah they're they're they're, they're right in the shallows they're stirring it all up uh, like they're everywhere and so, uh, you know, we're working with special areas. We're actually going to be presenting t down there shortly. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would like to try to go back. It all depends on manpower. But uh, they supposedly uh, go up the creek there in the spring, early spring, like April, in, in the gazillions. And so uh, we're going to think about building a super sane and, uh, and have some fun. And, and uh, we can do it before we start stocking trout. Um, there's a few of us that might go down there and try to sane the creek when the fish are going to spawn and see how crazy it is for, for, for carp. Well, that'd be interesting to hear the results on that. Yeah, well, I was shocked that we caught 350,000, but uh, some of those sane poles were, were crazy. And, and when you went on the reservoir um, where we found the carp, the baby carp, there's no way when you're driving the boat you would ever thought that that's where the mother load of carp would be. Um, this one area on the uh, west side of the reservoir is a real flat part that's full of cows. <laughs> and uh, the cows are like right at the edge of the, of the reservoir. And uh, the water's quite shallow and it's shallow for a long period of time. And, and uh, that was actually one of the areas we caught a lot of tiger trout, uh, the baby tiger trout that I was showing you in that graph down here at the at that 15 centimeter size they were all in these really shallow bay feeding on on the baby carp and uh and so same with the campbell lake strain rainbows and then where i showed you that picture of us standing in that in that bay we only stumbled upon that site we were trying to uh, drive along a, a little a little trail and all of a sudden we looked down and there was you know all the 50 pelicans just feeding like crazy and so we said let's try this spot because the reservoir is quite big right mm -hmm. and uh you know that was about day seven of us working on the pond and then what we did is we just picked the top four locations uh on the reservoir and we just hammered them every single day with our scene and uh and just stopped going anywhere else or it wasn't if we weren't catching 500 carp in a scene that you would only say walk about 20 to 50 you know feet or so um you, you didn't waste we didn't want to waste our time right okay well thank you for that yeah you betcha no it's it was a lot of fun uh i tell you when you went into just inside your tent at night you were you were uh pretty tired here's uh <laughs> here's your competition on this reservoir i mean you we're seeing what? this yeah seeing this on a lot of our our reservoirs this is um it's about 80 cormorants uh sitting on this reservoir and uh you know probably about 100 to 200 pelicans. And so they're, they're sitting at this little um, sandbar that comes out. And uh, what's really crazy about this site is there's no, there's hardly any carp in this area. We seen it, they, didn't, they weren't crazy about us working in this area, but uh, you know, you would think, oh, well, there's gonna be a ton of food there. Uh, and and uh, we barely would catch any carp in that bay there. And then it was uh, further down the reservoir uh, where we hit the mother lobe. Was there a question there? Yeah, I, I was just kind of wondering if, if, if this is something that's even on the radar at all. Like when I saw your numbers of, of carp there, you know, I mean, that's virtually impossible to eradicate short of draining the, the lake and letting it dry for three years to just to be sure, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, pike eat those carp. Oh, here we go. And they grow very big on eating those carp. And I can tell you another thing from experience because I've eaten 
pike that came out of lakes that had carp um, back in my home country. And boy, those pike tasted sweet like I haven't tasted since. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort to put all that trout in, in water that's turbid like that. Mm. And it seems that there's a nutrient load problem related to, you mentioned cows more than once yeah. uh, when talking about this water. So for, for something that, that gets so much, you know, cow presence, um, it's probably a water quality issue that's even unrelated. I mean, the carp just makes a bad problem worse. But maybe a natural predator like that would would be able to sort of bring bring things back. In, in yeah, I, you know, I, th I think that it's something that the special areas is gonna, you know, special areas, God bless them, they spent a ton of money at that campground down there. It's one of the nicest campgrounds you'll see. And uh, so, so we've uh, really got a great relationship with uh, John, John Armstrong down there that runs the, the site there. And uh, so, you know, we committed to seeing, putting our foot in the water, so to say, to see, what is the population of carp? And, and I'm hoping that uh, we're, we're going to have the people, I hope, to be able to go down there again this summer and, and see uh, if we've made a dent in the, um, in the population. So the way I look at it, by removing, let's just say, 350,000 little guys, or even the 5,000 one-year-old plus, um, those things were going to create babies on their own eventually, uh, whether it was a year from now or, or what. But uh, so we're removing potential spawners. Maybe we made a small dent in, 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 the, in the fishery. Um, and I think the idea of putting the, uh, when Jason Cooper uh, decided to put tigers in there and the Browns was focusing on trying to eat the, the carp, right? And so I tell you, it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a brown trout fishery if you could figure out how to get the, your lures or whatever to, to the brown trout. Uh, it's, you know, they, they're there and they're there in lots of browns in there. The browns are doing well and the fathead uh, minnows there are just gorgeous, really nice chunky fish. We were picking ourselves that we didn't, you know, uh, have any bait dishes, but uh, somebody in the bait business could go to town on that reservoir um, because uh, what's really cool about the, uh, the fatheads, they uh, not necessarily uh, are they there with the carp in big numbers. And so um, when you hit the mother load of flathead minnow sites, you didn't get a lot of carp. And then uh, so uh, there's a lot of food in that reservoir. Visibility is poor. You rarely saw any fish jumping. Um, so there just wasn't the, you know, the vertebrates, the bugs uh, on that reservoir during the day when we were working. And uh, it's a tough fishery. Uh, Jason's got a, a lot of thinking to do on the reservoir. Um, whether or not they would ever consider putting Wally or Pike or whatever in there, I don't know. I think I think the uh, special areas really want to bring the reservoir back to the way it once was because you used to get some really big rainbows out of there and the visibility in the reservoir was clear. But um, yeah, we'll see what they have to say. Uh, I mean, it's frustrating for them. Like I said, they spent a lot of money on that campground. And and just for, for those that don't know, um, the the issue for the camping is is that they're not getting the overnight usage at the campsite as much uh, with the carp fishermen as they were with the trout fishermen and so of course uh, they're not getting as much revenue on camping uh, because the fishermen are saying hey, you know I'm not catching the rainbows like I once once could and are going elsewhere. They're making a mistake by not advertising to people who like to fish for carp at night. There is such oh. a breed of people. <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I was uh yeah i mean uh, there's a lot of things i would be looking at i think they should be able to fish multiple rods but uh, they'd have to change the regs but uh it's pretty cool watching them uh, catch i can't say that we were really that popular uh once they once the carp fishermen figured out what we were doing i don't know if we were going to get any christmas cards this uh christmas from any of them but uh we put some smiles on some of them when we dropped off a pail full of big carp for them. Um, <laughs> anyways, the, the tiger trout, uh, one of the things we did this year uh, to, to learn is the tiger trout program is typically we stock the tigers always in the fall. 
And, uh, and so what we did with Little Bear Lake being so close to the hatchery and having staff to study it, uh, what we decided, we got permission from the biologist is uh, Little Bear Lake is a mixed fishery, rainbows, brooks, and tigers. And uh, we've been stocking tigers in there since about eight, 2018. And uh, we got permission to stock the tiger trout instead of the fall in, in the month of June. We stocked them at 22 centimeters. And uh, this lake, uh, Little Bear Lake, has got just a ton of stickleback uh, minnows that just everywhere in there. And in fact, those fight nets that I, I talked about, we've had them sink uh, with too much uh, uh, minnows in the nets uh, over fishing for 48 hours. And so um, we netted the lake in August 28th and uh, the tigers were already 28 centimeters. So, you know, phenomenal growth rate, uh, six centimeters in such a short period of time. And the growth rate was uh, 0 0.09 centimeters a day. So a trout in the hatchery, typically 10 degree water, will grow about 0 0.05 to 0 0.6 centimeters a day. So these guys are out, they outgrew the, the fish in the hatchery. The same tigers that were stocking this fall, uh, these tigers uh, were already uh, two centimeters larger than what we were stocking in the lake. So it, 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 it's quite a, an interesting uh, proposal to give to the biologists is that maybe on some of these lakes, because the tigers are such an aggressive fish, that bites the hook is maybe we look at stocking some tigers in the spring if we have confidence that the lake uh, auction wise is going to be okay over the summer and we don't have any summer kills you know maybe we should consider stocking uh, some of these tigers in the springtime and and maybe they'll do better in the lake over the summer than 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 by us holding them uh, for the fall so it, it's something that we'll be approaching the biologists to consider in some of the lakes uh, in alberta in uh, this coming spring uh, a big tiger, we caught some big tigers in this lake, uh, you know, 50 centimeter tigers. Uh, and this is from the 2018 fall stocking. Uh, so the, the fish went in the fall at 2018 at 23 centimeters. And so you can see in just almost two years, the, the fish has grown 27 centimeters. And so uh, besides being the mayor of Coal Lake, I'm trying to encourage you guys to come up to Coal Lake with this. But, um, this is uh, the picture of the big uh, tiger that uh, we caught. So this is from the 2018 stocking. And uh, there's that 50 centimeter beautiful looking uh, uh, tiger that uh, we caught in the nets. So again, and some of those lakes that you guys might fish for tigers, um, what we're finding is, is that if there's a minnow, and this is just our opinion, but if there's a really big healthy population of minnows, um, you know, these fish really will take on them. In the beginning, they don't necessarily know what the heck that thing over there is they're supposed to eat. But uh, in the hatchery, the, uh, you know, the tigers, of course, are on a pellet feed that hits the surface and then slowly sinks. Um, the, the tigers will, won't feed in a big bunch like a rainbow. They'll individually go up uh, and take their time and pick up the pellets, but they don't school up like a rainbow and just go crazy. So the tigers are, are very, very polite fish, and uh, they'll hit that pellet and go right back down to the bottom. And that's why they're such a popular fish is they're they're hitting performance on the fly or the lures is pretty phenomenal. And typically they'll go right back down to the bottom because they basically are hunting uh, from that bottom up or from, you know, to the side. But uh, they're, they're, they're known to, to be, be nailing it. What we're finding interesting on the dead tigers that we did catch out of uh, Blood Indian and uh, is that the, the stomachs are almost always empty in uh, some of the tigers that we, uh, we, we, we caught. We, we barely ever find a lot of uh, minnows and stuff in these tigers. So uh, I don't know what that is telling us if they got a fast metabolism or what, but, but uh, it, it's one of the, f uh, the brown trout at Blood Indian, we caught a lot of um, stomachs open and a lot of fat heads, carp in them, but the tigers, they, uh, their, their gut track was, was pretty empty, uh, not much in there. Um, I wanna talk about Hassey Lake. Um, so that, again, uh, we worked on this lake uh, a little bit uh, this summer. And uh, so this is exciting. It used to be about a 40,000 uh, fish. I think we used to stock back in the day in, in Hasse. And of course we tried walleye you know, one year in, in Hasse. Um, but uh, so this spring, uh, because the ACA are working on, on getting aeration there, um, Stephen Spencer uh, directed us to uh, stock some, uh, some rainbows in there this spring. And we stocked the uh, Trout Lodge jumper strain in there, uh, two end fish. 
and uh, 20, 20 centimeter uh, fish May 11th, and the growth rate was was phenomenal. Uh, when the staff texted me the, the, the numbers <laughs> when they were working on the water uh, end of August, I was just uh, couldn't believe it. And so the growth rate, you know, um, you know, uh, phenomenal growth rates of uh, 0.1 uh, centimeter a day to 0.17. I mean, just incredible growth. And so we caught 72 rainbows, uh, ranging from you know, 34 to 43 centimeters in length. And um, so in the fall, <clears throat> because of the success, uh, uh, Stephen uh, uh, had to stock another 2,500 rainbows and uh, some tiger trout, some big tigers, 500. And then we stocked some small tigers in there and uh, of 11 centimeters. We're, this winter, we have a camera trio going on. And we're going to have Dominic and uh, Shannon that works for me at the, uh, the walleye technician at the Polycatchy. They're going to be uh, creeling the anglers this winter on a rotation. And like I said, the ACA is uh, aerating the pond. So pretty exciting uh, times at Hassie. This is a picture of the um, a Trout Lodge jumper uh, that was hitting 40 centimeters. You can see that the problem with uh, <laughs> such a fast growth rate is the head doesn't catch up to the body. And so you'll get that real short, stubby, uh, famous trout lodge jumper type of head, and uh, but these uh, these 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 fish grow fat, and, and they just they uh, Dominic said the uh, amount of food supply in uh, in Hassey Lake was unbelievable. Uh, everything in, is there between from shrimp uh, to minnows, just the vertebrates was off the charts. So the fish there, the, the anglers this winter got a lot of competition uh, there. Uh, this is Star Lake. Uh, always wanted to get into Star and, and uh, kick the tires in there. So uh, we worked on Star Lake. Uh, we, in fact, we probably worked uh, this uh, year on about 10 to 12 different water bodies uh, throughout the province. So I just got a few of them listed here because I, I knew the crowd was going to be around the Edmonton area. Uh, so Star Lake, um, we uh, set 10 fights overnight. So these are again those fight nets that uh, have a lead on them. The fish sort of hit the lead and then and swim parallel, and they and they go into a sort of uh, almost like a small soccer cage, and in they go, and they're there, and we just lift the, the cage. And so even a nice little crayfish figured out how to get into uh, a fight net. So actually, our fight nets caught uh, crayfish pretty good, actually. So there's lots of crayfish in Star, and um, and then we also did uh, about uh, 18 uh, quick quick gill net sets um, while we're fight fishing. And unfortunately, we only caught about two rainbows out of star, and uh, but we did catch a lot of yellow perch, and uh, you can see the size range of the yellow perch um, in uh, in uh, star. Yeah, I think I got a question there. No, we're good. Um, so this is a picture of uh, the uh, the gill net set, and this isn't a very popular uh, picture for the staff that are working. Uh, the yellow perch love to tangle up a gill net really fast. So eventually I got a text from the staff saying, we need to abort this mission, uh, this is crazy. And so uh, we, we stopped doing a lot of the gill net sets for uh, on Star because we were just catching so many perch. But uh, So certainly Star Lake, unfortunately, looks like it's turning into a into quite a dominant uh, perch fishery. And it's pretty, you know, for those that uh, fish uh, perch, I mean, they're starting to get up to be a pretty big size, 23 centimeters. The um, another lake we worked on was East Pit. Uh, probably I'm going to go back again uh, next year on East Pit. Um, a little bit challenging uh, to work, uh, get a boat, a good boat down into that area to, to work at it for the staff. But uh, uh, the biologist has a stocking 11,600 rainbows in there each year. We've been stocking, I'm trying to stock the Pit Lake uh, strain fish in there. Um, it's a, it's a coal mine type of uh, lake, and I'm trying to stock pit lake strains consistently in, in certain water bodies. East Pit is one of them. Shemluck is another one. Uh, just see how, how good they, they do. Uh, we've stocked some jumpers in there back in 18, uh, and, uh, and then the, in the Campbell Lake strain in 17, 16. Uh, again, same procedures, fight nets and short set gill nets end of August. And then we did catch 21 rainbows in there and size was 18 to 32 centimeters, uh, plus the crayfish and uh, one big huge sucker, 55 centimeters. And, uh, but what we found was the, when you look at the data, the growth rate is probably half of what we're seeing on all the other stock water bodies. So that is concerning. And uh, the pit lake strain is a slow growing fish, which isn't surprising us. It's the same way at the, 
at the hatchery, they're a very slow growing uh, a rainbow trout. And they're only probably growing about a centimeter a month in, in uh, East Pitt. So we'll see, I mean, eventually the fishermen will probably contact us and us and Spencer and say, hey, you know, enough of the pit lake fish and just not producing a fishery. Uh, this is what a kind of, if anybody catches one, this is about a 20 some odd centimeter uh, pit lake strain fish uh, looks like. And uh, this one here came out of uh, uh, East Pit this uh, August when we're netting. You can see the net marks on the fish, unfortunately it died, but it, you know, not a bad size fish. Uh, to me, this is a Campbell Lake strain. Uh, just to buy the spotting, I, I feel it's it's probably uh, from the Campbell Lake strain that uh, you know we stocked back in uh, 2017. You know, it, it could possibly be a jumper, but the head is a lot uh, long, elongated, more than uh, more like a Campbell is. Uh, the jumpers seem to have uh, more of a flatter face, uh, pushed in face type of thing. So I I feel this is an East Pit, I mean a, a, a Campbell Lake strain, which indicates that. Uh, you know, the fish has been in there for a few years now and it's it's not really that big and so it's a bit concerning maybe the food supply in that water body is is, uh, is not the greatest right now uh, hard to say but i'd like i said earlier i'd like to go back into into east pit and maybe have my staff work there for about five days and really understand the water body better um this was a lot of fun uh lex and Ann. uh we were gonna this is one gonna be one of the locations to, to take the wall eggs from and so uh, we committed to try to catch the young of the year walleye. So what that means is uh, the fish spawn in uh, May and, uh, or April, sorry, May. And then when they hatch out, um, they're gonna live on plankton and then eventually uh, minnows uh, swim around the lake. And in around August area, they should be about uh, seven to nine centimeters by, by now. And so these fight nets are just great on catching young of the year walleye. Unfortunately, uh, we did 77 net sets, as you see in the, in, the, in, the, in the literature, and we just didn't catch any, none. We caught lots of perch, as you see in the picture, over 2,000. Uh, we caught lots of adult walleye. Uh, certainly the fight nets did really good catching, uh, catching the adult walleye. And you can see the sizes of, uh, of the walleye and, of course, the pike. And we caught some burbot, uh, really long, skinny things in, in that lake. But, uh, yeah, so it was, it was a good project for us. and. Uh, um, we committed, you know, I was really fortunate, a really good crew this uh, summer, uh, seasonal workers that uh, um, I picked up, I managed to pick up a parks guy that had the boat course, which was a godsend because the boat course wasn't offered this year because of COVID. So uh, for those that don't know, Dom. Is, is that a bourbon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The top left. Yeah, yeah. Real skinny thing, eh? And uh, um, all these fish, uh, because it was a fight net, they all got- Is that a bourbon? Uh, yeah, yes, it is. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yeah, that was a bourbon in the top Can you left. hear me? Yeah, you betcha, yeah. The, uh, uh, some of the, we've talked about this Fish before. Cod. Sorry? The- um, Freshwater cod. Yeah, there you go, freshwater cod, absolutely. Um, the fish got let go, so we didn't eat it. Um, this is a, just a real quick snap. I think most of you have seen this on the tiger trout limitations, but I just say in case anybody hasn't seen the presentation, um, the big thing about the tigers is just the survival. Um, once you fertilize the egg, um, you're, you're crossing a brown, brown trout female with a brook trout male. And uh, it's a bit of an art that the staff at the Allison Creek Hatchery have to do. They have to make sure they meet the commitment of the brook trout program, the brown trout program, and at the same time, try to make tiger trout. And so it's quite a balancing act. And so it, this gives you an indication of survival. The big, the big number to look at is, uh, is from eye to egg to four centimeters, 33% survival. That's what we're kind of uh, getting now, which is a lot better uh, than a few years ago. We are down about 15 to 18%, 19%. So we're up to 33%. Um, it's just the front end, as we call it, picking the dead bodies is really the only extra cost in raising a tiger. The, the food is the same, et cetera, and, and all that. So whenever you hear kind of the costing, it really only represents about, uh, you know, we've done studies on the extra manpower involved in picking the dead bodies. And so a good egg picker, a good fry picker with a siphon can do a thousand fish an hour. And so just the mortality 
you know, you do the numbers and it, in, on labor costs, it represents about an extra two cents. So pretty minimal uh, in, in the overall scheme of things. I know I've seen on some of the chat rooms because uh, we do sort of browse around and see what, what the latest gossip is. Um, you know, some of the literature on the Tigers isn't really necessarily correct. It's, it's only really an extra two cents uh, to cost the razor tiger versus say a, a rainbow or brown trout. And so the amount of uh, eggs that we need is about 300,000 eyed eggs. And so, you know, we're roughly needing at least 60 female browns and about 80 male brook trout at the Allison Creek hatchery for the 50,000 fish program. So that just sort of gives you an idea on the tiger trout program. And that seems like right now we're up to close to 30 lakes uh, that the biologists are asking us to uh, stock. And so, I mean, we've come up a long way. Um, somebody said they fished East Twin. Uh, that was uh, one of the original lakes that we stocked in 2015. We only had three lakes that we stocked back then, uh, Black Nugget, Lower Chain, and uh, East Twin. So, I mean, we're up to 30 now. And and in, and I don't think personally, it's just my personal opinion, I don't think tigers are suited for all of the lakes that we stocked. I think food is a real critical factor in, and, and the amount of tigers or, or the other fish that you're putting putting into the water body uh, are important. That's why you see Marcel up at the Lord Chain is really tweaking uh, that fishery and really staying on top of it, right? This is a, a good shot of uh, what a tiger looks like in the raceway. Uh, so about 21 centimeters in the shot, very long, long fish in the beginning of its life. It doesn't really start putting head and shoulders on, on, into, a, into at least its fourth year of uh, in, the, in the water body. That's why Fishermen just need a lot of patience and the tigers will eventually get quite big. We still got that old girl at the Allison Creek hatchery uh, from the 2012 egg uh, collection and she's over 21 pounds. Um, if you need any more information on what we do, um, you know, we've tried to as best we can with the staff uh, in the government here to try to spruce up uh, the My Wild Alberta site. Uh, we've got some stocking maps on there. We've got uh, the fish stocking reports, of course. And uh, we've made uh, three videos that are now uh, um, posted there, a little bit of write-up on, on the hatcheries. And then we've uh, have three videos there, one triploiding, genetics, and the quarantine. Really good videos. Uh, you can find them also on YouTube. And, uh, and I hired uh, Dave Jensen. He did a great, him and his wife did a great job on uh, putting those videos together, I thought. And uh, yeah, so that's... Uh, I think all I got there, that's a tiger trout, uh, an adult tiger trout that uh, we brought up to some of the lakes uh, when we thinned out uh, the tiger trout that we're holding at the Allison Creek Hatchery. We, we did that, uh, for those that don't know, we did that to, to sort of see how long can these, these fish live for. And then when we got approval to do the construction at Allison Creek, we wanted to lessen the amount of fish that we had inside the building. So we went around and stocked all of these uh, uh, I, I fish, I think it was around 2018, we started stocking them out, uh, quite a few of these big tigers. So I, anybody has any questions, uh, um, feel free to fire in. Yeah, Craig, it's uh, Paul here. Let's just jump the gun on Dan here because I know he emailed you a couple of years ago when we were out fishing at uh, East Pit. Yeah. And, uh, we actually, well, he actually landed a brown trout out there. Huh. Cool. And, and then <laughs> a couple of weeks after that, then John and I and Dan went out there and John landed a brown trout. Really? Now, whether it was the same fish, I don't know, but I mean, because you're not stocking browns out there, right? No, but uh, that's interesting. I'm writing that down. We, uh, um, yeah, I don't. The only way um, a brown trout may have gotten, I don't, I'm just trying to think of my top of my head. In the Edmonton area, the only brown trout fishery that we stock would be Muir Lake, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right, Peter? I think that yep. would be. Yeah, you're right. It's the only one. That would be the closest other than Obed Lake, right? So, you know, in, in what happens, it doesn't happen often, but uh, I could see the, the potential uh, that when the, at the hatchery, where the brown trout are, are in narrow uh, upper raceways. And it's quite possible that, uh, now the browns won't jump out of a raceway, but when we do sample counts, uh, or when Craig does hatchery tours with the kindergarten kids, 
it's quite possible that maybe a brown trout may have gotten put into a raceway that was trout that ended up in East Pit. Mm -hmm. East Pit is such a big stocking that it's uh, 11,600 fish is typically a two truck day and that's the only lake they they stock. So the only way that brown trout got into that lake would be from a hatchery, uh, a hatchery by accidental that maybe a brown trout got in with a, with a rainbow trout raceway, right? Or somebody's moving brown trout around the province, which, you know, unfortunately does happen, but I'd be shocked if someone attempted to do it in East Pit. So I, I would probably say that it probably came from the hatchery. If it did, then it, it grew exponentially. It was a it was a good size, and they had a good kite on it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's it's. I think the brown trout are getting a lot more respect uh, from the netting we're doing. Uh, the lakes that they're just growing huge. Uh, it's just a tough fish for the fishermen to catch. Uh, you know, um, maybe you know the purists are catching them, but. Um, a lot of people aren't, of course, in blood inning, but uh, after seeing what we saw at blood inning and how massive they are and how they're, well they're doing in Obed Lake, um, it, maybe it's something that Stephen could consider is, is, is maybe look at putting brownies in there and giving a whirl. I can't remember, I'd have to ask the girls what they got for, um, uh, for fish. Um, like we set up minnow traps um, in, in other methods. We try to sane the shoreline to see what's there for bugs, but I believe East Pit is a tough one for us to work on because of the banks. And yeah, I think it drops yeah, off, yeah. if I remember correctly, quite quickly. Yeah, it's a tough lake to fish from shore. Yeah. So yeah, maybe that's a good note uh, that I just wrote it down that maybe I, Stephen could consider for, for East Pit because it, it's a it's a unique water body and, and uh, maybe that's the I remember Stephen commenting, how, how the heck did a sucker get in there, right? So uh, one, of these, uh, one of these Edmonton lakes and, and uh, Dom was uh, on the road today, so I couldn't confirm it, but I thought one of the lakes, um, and she didn't text me, I thought one of the lakes that we worked on this year, and I thought it was East Pip, but I might be wrong, and I'm a little bit reluctant to say it, but I know one of the Edmonton lakes we caught a carp in, and I just can't remember which one it was. You know, I know it was sure a surprise to us when we pulled it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. the only lake that you stock browns in. Muir Lake, yeah, that's correct. Uh, there's not a lot of lakes uh, in that area that I that I can think of that we put brownies in. You know, there uh, no bed. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a there's a few ACA lakes, but uh, um, what I could do is uh, I can send uh, Bill or Ken or Peter a, a quick email uh, and just list the, the different brown trout lakes that we're stocking. And they are, they are uh, the list is growing, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, we are getting more requests for, for brownies, you know, like a thousand here, 2000 here type of thing, right? And, and Marcel's put them in uh, Lower Chain Lake also. And Craig, the, uh, the browns of Muir this year have, uh, have done quite well. Um, a number of people comment on the fact that uh, they go to they go to Muir now specifically for the browns because there are, there are a number there that are over fifty centimeters. Yeah, I think the food uh, like I think that's where guys like uh, you know the biologists are trying to tweak you know how many fish should you put in because you don't really want to overbalance what the lake can produce for food for these guys. So it's a bit of an art, right? Yeah. And then if, if you have good years for invertebrates and everything, I mean, the, the dominoes have to line up and you have to have good, uh, good overwintering of the oxygen. Like um, <clears throat> our staff go out onto these water bodies. Uh, we'll be probably hitting about uh, at least maybe 10 lakes this year and studying them for oxygen. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite stunning to see uh, the oxygen in, come March in some of these lakes like Diplomat, just a beautiful little water body and uh, hardly anything for oxygen in, in March last year. Yep. Craig, there's a question about uh, Chikaku Lake or uh, Black Nugget, if you have any observations. Yeah, we, uh, we didn't get over there. Uh, we want to. Uh, I, I like to hit it this, this coming season, but uh, we remember we used to stock uh, brookies in there and then uh, we're now stocking rainbows, right? But uh, 
you know, I think uh, these some of these lakes got to, you know, got to have a look at uh, aerating. I think some of the, we just got to figure out the cost, right? And uh, can we aerate every lake in Alberta? No, but, uh, um, you know, we're looking at aeration probably needs to be in uh, at least a good dozen water bodies uh, in Alberta, more than what we got right now. It's just a matter of expenses. Who's going to afford to pay for it? Um, but I think uh, Chicago can produce a lot of fish, uh, but I probably would want to put aeration. It's another one that has marginal water quality, um, yeah, especially in the month of March. I'm pretty sure Dom was on there this, this past winter and it hardly had anything for oxygen. How many lakes around Edmonton? I, well, I, in terms of aeration? Yeah. I, well, I would watch Star Lake. Uh, Star Lake is, uh, I mean, there, there's some really yeah. big rainbows out of Star. We just didn't pick them off. But uh, looking at some of the videos online, they're certainly there. Um, but uh, Star concerns me because of all the yellow perch in there. Um, if we can't turn yeah. that fishery away. But uh, I, I would look at uh, stock uh, aerating, probably Chicago. We aerate some, you know, the club is aerating salters. And that's turned into a nice little fishery, right? And uh, so I think at least two more lakes in that Edmonton area. Spring Lake is a concern about access. Um, that's too bad that access into that lake is so difficult, right? But I would, I would, if we could afford it, uh, you know, I would do two more lakes. Pick, pick, pick your one, whether it's uh, you know, uh, Chicago or whatever. But one of the ways uh, to answer your question a different way would be to come in and and if we had the staff and we could dedicate it is to go in and, and net these lakes uh, in the month of April before we stock them and, uh, and see if these lakes are overwintering. We were shocked actually that uh, there's a, a reservoir down south, uh, Machichi, that uh, <clears throat> Dom was doing oxygen on it and uh, there's hardly any oxygen, like I'm talking under three parts per million. But yet when, we, when she went out there and netted the lake before we uh, put the fish in, we actually caught 30 and 40 centimeter rainbow trout. So how they managed to live it out, uh, they must be right underneath that ice in the wintertime, just sucking right, right up at the shoreline because they, uh, right underneath the ice, because when we do the oxygen is on these lakes in the wintertime, uh, all the oxygen is at the very top of the water column. There's nothing down the bottom. And so especially when you get into that, if you notice the trout fishing, catching the fish is really bad later you get in the winter it's because there is no oxygen where you're actually putting your bait down um, a lot of the oxygen in some of these lakes is, is only at the very top of the water column genesee genesee I, I, you know what i i uh that's a neat a neat uh, lake we just uh, we stock only what i think uh top of my head is around 500 fish right i think we do a spring and fall on that one but we just haven't gone over there and kicked the tires on that one. There's so many to look at, eh? Again, uh, these little ones that you're talking about, like Genesee, do you put aeration on them? Um, now, you know, it's, it all goes back to the, the risk of the liability on the small ponds. Um, but no, I've never, we haven't put anybody on that water body yet, eh? Uh, do you fish that one? No. Yeah. Assey Lake. Oh, well, Hussey Lake there. This is going to be an interesting one. I'm uh, really looking forward to see uh, <clears throat> how many people are going to hit this lake and can they catch them with all that competition of food in there. If you guys are... I started at Hussey. I, I went out there to have a look at the aerators and uh, whatever. Thought I might, you know, there was ice forming on the lake already. So I figured I might try fly fishing off the dock for a while, but it was impossible. Too many people, you couldn't back us. <laughs> so, really? Yeah. Well, that's encouraging. Um, yeah, uh, I, I expect that. So Dom and and, Sh and Shannon are going to start creeling that lake um, maybe as early as December 1st. And so we'll go in there for four days, I think it is, and creel. And we'll have the continuous cameras uh, uh, going on that lake to, to record the amount of uh, use. So it'll be interesting to see how the fishermen do. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me um, that we see the same effect that we saw at Black Nugget, that the tiger trout uh, were easily caught uh, in the beginning of the wintertime. Uh, that's what uh, we saw back in, uh, 
oh, I think it was the winner of uh, 2015 and 16 uh, when the Creole Black Nugget and the uh, Tiger Trout uh, for every 10 fish. Uh, the Tigers were nine out of every 10 fish caught on Black Nugget uh, that winter. So even though we put 500 Tigers into, uh, into Hasse, it it's not going to be surprising to me that, that the fishermen are catching uh, you know, for every every five rainbows, uh, they'll catch uh, two two tigers hitting the line. But of course, if they're uh, going to keep the fish, um, like they did a black nugget, there won't be many left to catch or keep. Right? I mean, they'll be all, all caught out fast on on Hassie, unfortunately. Yeah, people want to know if if Cardiff was actually stocked this year. Oh yeah, um, I, I'm sorry if there's questions. I can't uh, for for the life of me figure out if anybody's texting me. Um, but so if you see questions or just fire them out, be a Cardiff was stocked in a big way. Uh, Cardiff is a pretty cool water body, um, and uh, so you can look at the stocking report. And uh, we uh, we put a lot of fish into Cardiff. I want to say Cardiff is probably well over ten thousand rainbows, and I I believe uh, we put. Uh, I'm pretty. I want to say that. Uh, that we put tigers in there too, I want to say. And I, I'd have to check the stocking report. And there were tigers in there. Yeah. There's uh, just so everybody knows, there's a ton of uh, minnows in there, like a lot. And so uh, uh, Cardiff is uh, one of the big water bodies that uh, I'm gearing up to try to get on next year, as I think it's a fascinating lake. Uh, I hired a, a company out of Calgary uh to do uh, really that really neat uh, i'm pretty sure it was part of that we did the neat uh, depth profile on cardiff with uh, that guy's technology where it uh, records the depth the bottom so if you go to the stocking maps uh, site in the uh, my wild alberta i believe uh cardiff lake was one of the ones that we have some really neat uh, depth profiles on i know chain lakes down in southern alberta i think there's about four or five lakes that i paid for uh and we did some really neat uh uh, depth profiling, but it, Cardiff is a really new, unique water body. But there's a lot of food in there. My Wild Alberta? Yeah, yeah. If, uh, if you go to My Wild Alberta and then you go to fishing and then fish docking and stocking maps, and I think if you look up Cardiff uh, Lake on the stocking maps, I believe Cardiff Lake is where um, I have a uh, a really neat uh, depth profile map in that. And, and uh, going back to my uh, my contacts, you can always, uh, oops, there we go, you can always uh, email me at this uh, email address. And uh, if you have any specific questions, just fire me, that's what I'm here for. And, uh, and if I can't answer your question, I'll just bullshit you, but uh, um, just kidding. You. But uh, yeah, you can just email me and uh, we'll try our best to, to uh, get you uh, some information on anything that's where we're here we're here to you know here to help uh, the fishermen out in alberta yeah. hey craig i've had a few people asking me about the uh the pond in warrenville on the north side there run but i think it was the afga that they stopped sorry i hard to hear you what was that again the uh the pond on north of uh in the town of morninville okay the uh it stopped and I thought it was run by the AFGA that's around there. Hmm. Yeah, the Mordrill fishing game. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. The, they were saying there was some browns and rainbows in there, but everybody I've been talking to that fished it, they weren't catching anything. So it's okay. Can you uh see my email? I just if you fire me off that question. Sure. And uh I believe uh, I'll have to look at my stocking reports. Some of the uh some of those lakes that you mentioned, um, the ACA may stock, but uh, oh, the ACA uh, has, we have a contract for um, roughly, uh, let's just say, and I might be off on the numbers, but say the ACA stocks 80,000 fish. Um, we have a contract with them for about 30,000 fish. And uh, and so we stock a lot of them, their, their fisheries that may have say three species of fish, brook trout browns and rainbows. Um, uh, I think that one that you speak of, uh, I believe, is uh, the brown. I think we stocked that one with brown trout for the ACA, but I might be wrong. But I'll, I could, if you just shoot me an email, I'll be able to tell you. Yeah, because there was a, a couple of guys that lived right there in Morninville, and they took their kids out there because it was a nice, easy yeah. pond to fish from. 
but uh, it was frustrating in the sense. So it's... yeah, you know, it, so uh, I had to say this in a polite way. Um, so we actually did uh, some of these requests this uh, summer. So the biologists would contact us and say, "Hey, uh, so and so lake, they're not catching the fish. Um, did you guys stock it? You know what, what's happened?" And so we went to uh, a good example is Dixon uh, Dam Pond on my Red Deer, right? And so nobody was catching the fish, and so uh, our crew went in the water and, and uh, netted, and sure enough, caught, caught the trout. Um, so it's just, you know, uh, that's why we're really interested in Hassie Lake. Are people really going to pull these fish out pretty easy, or is the competition what's in the water column? Um, you know, the fishermen are up against the, all the bugs and everything in the water body, but but this is common this year uh, for whatever reason probably was the highest amount of complaints, you know, that I heard from the fishing on, on a lot of water bodies. Uh, and so what was going on? Like, was the, did the water heat up fast? Um, because once the water gets really warm, <clears throat> I find anyways that the, the rainbows and uh, the browns and all that, everybody's going to go off bite. And uh, the water, like there are temperatures that our staff are recording in the month of July and August. Is like 23 to 25 degrees Celsius at the surface. Some of these water bodies that we're stocking, it's phenomenal. And there's no oxygen at the bottom of the pond. It might be 19, 20 degrees down at the bottom at uh, say six meters, seven meters, but there's virtually no oxygen in some of these water bodies. And so, you know, I'm not surprised a lot of people aren't catching trout in the month of July in some of our water bodies that we put fish into. I think the fish are just trying to sustain themselves and their metabolism just shuts down because there, there's so little oxygen going on. And, and this is the beauty of aeration. And that's maybe why salters is fishing so well, is that at least the pond is getting some oxygen. It's turning over with the aeration type of thing, right? But this year, we had a lot of emails, uh, you know, been doing this for a long time. I, I would think that this year was the most complaints I've heard in a long time. I think that's just because of the situation we're in with the COVID-19 everybody wanted to get out and do stuff well I mean some of the fishing stores tell me that their sales were up like 30 percent this year yeah. um, which is great you know a lot of we'll see what uh, the end what how many fishing licenses were sold but uh, I do know that some of the stuff that we did post on my wild Alberta and all that we were getting some tremendous hits uh, one of the more popular one was and maybe some of you guys saw it is for the first time I believe it was um, we actually put a list of lakes and the stocking dates and the fish uh, online. And uh, the, the staff that load up all of this stuff on the internet, uh, not me that does it, that's for sure, um, said that they got some of the biggest uh, downloads uh, on, uh, on that type of information. So people wanted to know when their lake was getting stocked and, uh, and all that. So pretty cool. And we'll try to do it again this spring, uh, give a, a rough idea on uh, when we'll be uh, stocking these lakes because it's quite funny uh, uh, people will show up uh, the next day or that day uh, 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 when we stock a lake eh? great don anderson here oh yeah how you doing i'm doing well Excellent. I, I, I i would wish to thank you oh. for, for the opportunity to catch a whole pile of different type of trout species in alberta um, you know, I've, I've fished this place for about 65 years and boy, it's kind of neat to go out there and catch, uh, uh, you know, browns and, and uh, tigers and certainly a whole bunch of new rainbows that are a lot different than they used to be. And I thank you for that. That's, that's been really a fine step in a great direction. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, I, got, I got great staff that work for me and the biologists also, uh, you know, be on, on board with uh, trying new things. So it's a good, it's, uh, it's changing and we're pretty excited about the raven. Um, even though I talked about, say, bull trout and uh, cutthroat trout and grayling in that one building, um, basically is that third building at the raven is going to be whatever, wherever the direction is, right? Uh, who knows uh, what the fish is going to be in, in 20 years, right? So uh, it's in our business, you can you can change and adapt, uh, but uh, we're pretty excited. Uh, Minister Nixon uh, deserves all the credit for we're finding the money uh, in Treasury Board to uh, to uh, uh, convince the Minister of Treasury Board to uh, finance the, the new raven. We're really excited. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, you know a beautiful little hatchery in a, in a beautiful part of the world down there. You said bulls. Are you guys going to culture bulls out of there? 
Well, what, it, it's going to be a, a room for the biologists that if they want to uh, enhance the bull trout fishery in, in Alberta, uh, we can do that. Uh, so they, the, the thought process is, is two ways. Either they go in and we do, uh, I don't know if you saw the, the slides on the quarantine trailer. It's a very simple operation. You take the eggs from the wild, put them inside that quarantine trailer, and then return the, uh, the fish as an eyed egg into these RSIs, as they call them, right into the stream, put them in there, let them hatch into the, the creek or the river uh, as a bull trout, and away they go, and they imprint right on the creek. Or uh, we would collect the eggs, uh, do a spawning uh, right at uh, these sites, and raise the fish inside the, the raven hatchery, uh, test them, of course, for diseases, but raise them, create your own brood trout program, uh, bull trout, and then uh, and, and raise the fish uh, uh, and stock them up whatever size the biologist directs us to. So, I mean, the, the bull trout, we've done bull trout before at the Calgary hatchery, so it, it can be done. Uh, same with the cuts, whatever... We're here for whatever the biologists want us to do, really, to be honest with you. In our business, uh, in aquaculture, a fish is a fish, right? And so uh, whatever- well, My is, world is not. <laughs> but, yeah, we'll, we'll, so we, uh, we're, we'll adapt to anything. And uh, you know, uh, it's always neat. The tiger trout was probably uh, you know, uh, the neatest thing we've done in a while. I'm really excited to get back into the walleye program. The walleye are probably one that and that is one, one more cool question, plan. Craig. Uh, yeah. As a product of this, this uh, running disease conference that was held online mm -hmm. here several months ago, it appears like there's some of the states in the, that are really working hard to come up with a warning disease resistant group. Yeah. Of, yeah. Of are, are you guys aiming in the same direction? No, uh, no, we're not. Um, but I, I know what you speak of, and it, it could be done in Alberta. Um, but uh, you would, uh, one of the things that's different, I, and, and this is just my opinion, Don, is um, we don't stock a lot of rivers and creeks where we stock none, except for the Medley River up here in north of Coal Lake, right? So all our waters are standing waters. And so um, does the, uh, I think it's called, isn't it called the Hoffer strain down in Colorado or something that uh, is resistant to, to whirling disease, I think it was, but, um, they haven't really gone and kicked the tires of how much whirling disease is, is in all our stock water bodies, right? They did a lot of rivers and creeks in Alberta, but they haven't really dived into how many other than Open Creek uh, Reservoir, how many other lakes are we, do we have whirling disease in? Um, but anything's possible. Uh, we could definitely go down there if, if, if that's the direction the biologists wanted to, we could focus now. One of the easiest ways, of course, is, is to try to obtain uh, eyed eggs from an existing resistant strain uh, in the United States, right? And so that would be, that would, if that's the way they wanted us to go, um, that is one of the options that you could do if you wanted to, to, to build a resistant, uh, to build a resistant to whirling disease, your own brood program, or you would go in the wild and try to collect from an existing wild strain in Alberta that is adapting to whirling disease and, and try to culture them. But irregardless, you're probably gonna hold them inside a quarantine type of facility. And we do have uh, that ability at the Calgary Hatchery. We have a small dedicated room that's specifically built for, for quarantining whatever it is that you bring in. So we brought in the cutthroat trope from Joe Blake we brought in the, the bull trout program in there, the grailing trout program, and you bring it in there so that you don't cross-contaminate uh, those fish with your production fish, right? So I, I, I'm, we're always open to the challenge. Um, we just need to understand if, if that's where the biologists want to go is, is to try to save some of the, like you say, the Bull River rainbows or whatever it is that they try to save. And then let's dive into it and try to see what is the... Uh, what solutions that we, we can do, right? Uh, from, a, from a personal experience, uh, I've like I fished a fair amount in southern Alberta, yeah. and and I'm not finding any small fish in the Livingston area at all. Like mm -hmm. they're 14 inches plus, which mirrors what what I heard out of the Madison when there was nothing left but 14 to 18 to 20 inch rainbows, and all of a sudden. 
they died and it was dead. Like yeah. Dick Vincent uh, made that very clear on the first running disease conference when he came up here. Um, you know, we probably, but the sounds of the lower crow, it's gone already. So, you know, it's only seems to be the only time in his experience was that, that about 80% of the population died. Now, whether we'll see that here or not, I don't know. But, you know, at the Hopper strain, that only take, what, 50 or 60 years before it become enough of them around that they, uh, they were resistant. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm 75 years old. I ain't got 60 years left. Yeah, I hear you. Um, so... One of the, if the, say, uh, I'm just throwing stuff in the air, don't, uh, you know, if the biologist wanted us to say at some of those locations that you, you mentioned, um, to create a rainbow trout fishery is, uh, we would have probably, the smart thing would be to do to take our existing strains that we have, which would be the Campbell Lake strains, the Beatty strains, and, um, and the Pitt Lake strains of in-house rainbow trout strains, right? Made in Alberta strains and challenge them uh, yeah. with whirling disease, right? Maybe yeah. put them in cages, yeah. put, them in, put them in a controlled uh, environment to see if these things uh, get this, you know, knocked, they'll get knocked out or maybe they're gonna be resistant, right? Um, but, uh, you know, that's one way. Otherwise you try to go acquire a, a, a strain somewhere. Um, unfortunately- well, That's what they did in Colorado. They, they mixed the hopper strain I think second generation down uh, with their, you know, their, their native population and, and they were getting good success with that. And which is essentially what you mean. Thank you very much, Craig. And like I said, thank you very much for what you're doing for us. I appreciate oh, okay. it. I'm, 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 it's a great job. And, you know, like I said, uh, I got, we got great staff to work at all the hatcheries. So it's an easy job for me. We've run a little bit over time here. So uh, I'd like just to take an opportunity to say thanks very much for taking out so much of your time today, Craig. I know it was uh, really interesting for uh, for a lot of us on the call today. A lot of really interesting news about what's happening at the uh, hatcheries and the brood stations. And you shared a whole bunch of bonus information about uh, some of the programs and projects that you've gone on. Uh, just yeah. like to say thank you very much for taking your time and spending those tonight. Yeah, and, and just uh, closing, you know, thank, anybody can reach out and email me. Uh, that's what I'm, I'm here for. Uh, and on those three videos, uh, certainly back to those videos, I hope you can find them. Uh, we wouldn't mind hearing what you guys think of them and, and uh, also um, any suggestions for other videos and thinking that it, it's about the hatcheries, right? So uh, as much as I would love to go fishing down in the lower, in, in the rivers and all that, but it would have to be sort of a hatchery angle and uh, we maybe uh, future videos. So any suggestions would appreciate it. Great. Thanks very much, Craig. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Craig. Yeah, you betcha. Thanks.